Well, it's only taken me 15 years, but I've finally got the scenery done to the point where I've only got two small patches of bare plywood left to fill. The larger of the two is next to the QNNE and Conrail Junction and Diamonds. And the smaller one is tucked away behind the West Switch Tower next to the Interchange Yard. I've had these kits for an awful long time, but I've always hesitated to start building them because I knew it would lead to having to string wires between poles. I also hesitated because I knew the incoming power had to be brought to the substation somehow. Fortunately, Walters has released uh, modern high voltage transmission towers. I prefer these over the old fashioned lattice ones because the uh, fine cross section of the lattice work never really translates well in HO scale, unless it's made of brass or something like that. The plastic injection uh, molded versions, it, it just, it's too thick. It doesn't look realistic. On the other hand, these aren't perfect either, as they only scale out to about 70 feet tall, and the prototypes uh, are typically taller than that. My thinking was that if I place the uh, substation at the junction, the transmission towers would come off the hill in the distance down uh, next to the junction and continue off uh, to the left, uh, reaching the edge of the layout somehow. I didn't really want it to fall around the curve here, but somehow it would, uh, through these, this small forest grove, disappear off the edge of the layout. Similarly, uh, if I place the substation next to the uh, west tower, it would still come off the uh, corner in the forested area and down across the lake here uh, to the substation and then continue on uh, either across the yard disappearing against the backdrop or following down uh, along the main line between the, uh, the two main tracks and the yard tracks. But that's probably a non-starter because of all the hand throw turnouts that you'd have to reach over the wires to throw. In the end, the transmission line uh, is secondary to our analysis here, as it could always be the end of the line. So the real question is, where does the substation fit best? Here's a look at the uh, as-built. We've jumped ahead here. We will get through the details in a minute, but this is a, a sampling of a, an almost finished kit to see what it would look like uh, at the two potential locations. I myself am leaning towards the smaller site uh, as I feel the substation looks a little bit lost on the larger site. Plus, you would expect a, a substation next to a bunch of large industries as opposed to open fields. And here's another little teaser photo a little further along uh, with painting begun. Let me know your thoughts on my choice of location in the comments. This is one of those kits with lots and lots of tiny parts uh, and very simple instructions. So I would recommend examining all the different parts closely, uh, comparing them to the photos or exploded diagrams that are in the instructions. The instructions are not perfect. Uh, they're adequate to, to get you through, but um, there are some instances that I'll point out as we go along where um, it would have been nice to, to understand uh, a little bit better how some of these things go together or why, uh, particularly um, when understanding where wires go. Ultimately, this kit doesn't include any of the connecting wires and the last diagram doesn't really um, give you a good understanding or the best or complete understanding of how all these parts are connected later with the actual um, wires. I followed the instructions uh, in the same order. They have numbered uh, major subsections uh, of the kit, the first one being the transformer. The transformer is basically a box with six sides and uh, 12 radiators, plus a few details. Each radiator is made by gluing two halves together. Here you see steps one and two of the instructions completed. Step two is the A-frame in the background. 
Note that the radiators and the clips that hold them in place should not be glued to the transformer at this time as they will need to be painted separately. Step three involves assembling the three sets of three small transformers, including their brackets and control cabinets. This part of the kit is uh, smartly designed. When you create the transformers from the two halves each, they drop into the frames once you've assembled the frames uh, and um, dangle there kind of until you put a drop of glue on it. So they're, they're easy to, to set in place. What's unclear from the instructions is at what height to place the control cabinet. Uh, the, the instructions uh, don't really say specifically whether to put it on the ground or have it some distance off the ground. I chose to put it some distance off the ground just by eye. There is a correct orientation to the cabinet. The door handle to the right side door should be on the right side. The instructions don't remind you to do that. Step four involves assembling what I call the W and Pi frames. This is a very easy uh, and quick step. However, you need to file down the mold lines so that when you glue the parts together, they seat properly and adhere to each other uh, at 90 degrees. As the glue is drying, you'll want to make sure that the parts that you are attaching to the Pi frame align vertically with the W frame. Step five is the assembly of the three larger transformers that sit underneath the A-frame from step two. Assembling the transformers is easy enough, but aligning them to their foundation is best done uh, by using the uh, foundation sheet that comes with the kit. Note that this step is purely for alignment purposes only. You should not glue anything into the concrete slab foundation yet. In fact, after painting each of the components, I believe there'll be a snug fit so you don't actually have to glue them in. Note that many of the pre-drilled holes in the foundation slab have flash that are actually blocking these holes. That's quickly fixed with a small needle nose file. As noted earlier, the placement of the control cabinet is left somewhat at your discretion. Step six is the most complex uh, of the project. Uh, it is best done with the frames sitting in the pre-drilled holes in the foundation. Once the basic frame has been assembled and the glue has uh, firmly set up, it needs to be popped out of the foundation, turned over to install the rest of the parts. Once the glue has set up on the four additional crossbars that you've just installed, it's now time to uh, add the nine long circuit breakers. You'll want to be careful with these. They're a little bit fragile. Uh, one of mine uh, came broken already uh, in the box, but it's a, an easy quick fix with a drop of glue. One of my biggest pet peeves is how manufacturers decide to uh, connect parts to the sprues. There is absolutely no excuse for what they did here. It makes it impossible to properly trim off the flash without damaging the actual insulator. You'll want to keep an eye on these as the glue dries. Make sure that these nine pieces stay vertically true uh, and not become lopsided. Once we are done with the long circuit breakers, we repeat the exact same process with the nine short circuit breakers. Next are the nine T-shaped insulators. These have actually been designed to fit snugly over the peaked shape of the crossbar, so no filing is necessary. That brings us to the last bits and pieces here, the uh, six pieces of uh, connecting rods and the main insulator bar across the front of the unit. Note the three different lengths of L-shaped connecting rods. 
The insulated crossbar is designed to only fit in one way, but all the same I still found I had to use uh, clothespins to hold it in place as the glue dried. Speaking of connecting rods, there are three more that are used to connect the W and Pi frames uh, from step four. Once again, it's best to try and install these with the parts sitting in the foundation holes. Unfortunately, I reamed out the holes a little bit too much, so the parts were wobbly. Uh, that was easily fixed by um, poking fresh holes through some masking tape and using a square block to hold everything vertical while the glue dried. One of the challenges here is gluing a rod to a flat surface, so it helped to flatten one end. When I first started building the kit, I intended to keep the insulators uh, separate and paint them uh, from the sprue. But since there were so many other insulators that were already part of, of other parts, uh, I decided to uh, install them all. Now in this case, uh, ease of painting lost out to a good solid glue bond. I wasn't too keen on, on a solid monochrome light gray uh, paint scheme for this facility. I know that some prototypes perhaps look that way. I've seen others where the frame structure was a little darker. Uh, so I wanted to try and emulate that. And, and, I, and the closest I could get with what I had on hand was an older can of light gray primer. Uh, and then I purchased a newer can of a medium gray primer. The medium gray uh, worked out just fine, as you'll see. It went on beautifully. The light gray had ideas of its own, as you will see. At first, the light gray application was just fine. Since it was a primer, I expected it would have a dry or, or uh, very flat finish, which was fine. I thought to myself, no problem. I'll just give it a coat of clear coat to give it a bit of shine. But lo and behold, it turned yellow. Note that the coloring is quite uneven, suggesting a kind of weathering for very old equipment. So I'm faced with a real uh, fork in the road kind of question here. Do I start over repainting the transformers into a light gray? Or do I keep going and just finish off the project by painting the insulators a, an off-white or light, light gray color. Note that these last few photos were taken in my garage in direct sunlight. Uh, it has quite a different look on the layout even though I'm using daylight bulbs. Love to hear your thoughts on this. Let me know in the comments if you think I should repaint the transformers or just keep going.